As sinners, we won't recognize our need for a Savior. When people say, well, I, I'm really not that bad of a person. I'm, I'm really okay. Then why do we need Jesus? <laughs> If we're, if we're really just okay. And a lot of times we end up comparing ourselves to other people. When you look through that, uh, that series of pictures just a little bit ago of each individual person, didn't some of those people elicit a response in you when you saw their picture? Some of them it may have been disgust. Others of them it may have been, oh, um, I, I like them, or, you know, it's sad that they're dead, or it's really not so sad that they're dead. Or, um, but but they, uh, they elicit a response in us, and we have a tendency to compare ourselves to other people. And so we look at other people and we say, well, you know what? I'm not as bad as Osama bin Laden, so... I'm good. Or, I'm, you know, I'm not as bad as Hitler, so I'm okay. Well, you know what? Hey, I, I didn't start the whole pornography industry in America. I'm not Hugh Hefner, so I, I'm okay. But in reality, when we compare ourselves to a holy God, everything pales in comparison. Uh, there's a passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 64 talking about all of our righteous acts. And it says that all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. The literal translation, and I'm not trying to be crass, but this is so that you can understand where we're coming from. The literal translation for filthy rags would have been used minstrel rags is the comparison. That's what that translated means. All the very best good that we can do, when, it com- when we compare it to the reality of a holy God, that's how good it is. So when it's, that, when it's like that, all of a sudden, all of it starts to look pretty bad. But to realize that we all have a sin nature. Every person, regardless of the best philanthropist in the world, who gives their money, who's generous, um, who serves, all of those things certainly important and definitely should be a part, um, in particularly, of a Christian's lifestyle once they've accepted Christ. But those acts in and of themselves aren't what saves them. It's Christ. And each one of us needs to recognize that. Another one I want to look at, and, and at first you're going to go, wait a minute. But here's the myth. All sin is the same. Now, before you jump on, before you jump on me... Um, let me help you understand this, okay? A lot of times in the church, we even compare ourselves to each other, don't we? And, if, if, and at times, if we talk to someone, hey, I see this area of your life that you're struggling in, sometimes it's really easy for us to be defensive and go, well, it's not as bad as what you're doing. Ever been in that boat before? Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that. Maybe you've been on the giving end of that. But a lot of times people will say, well, doesn't God say that all sin is the same? No, he doesn't. Um, however, I want to make this abundantly clear. When it comes to unforgiven sin, all unforgiven sin is the same in that it separates us from God. Okay? Okay? All unforgiven sin is the same in that it separates us from God. However, and the punishment for unforgiven sin is the same. It's an eternity in hell. 
That is the same. However, our obedience or our disobedience does influence certain things, and Scripture actually talks about them. Our disobedience or obedience influences, number one, our rewards in heaven. Scripture clearly says that there will be rewards in heaven for us when we get there. Okay? The other thing is it will affect our punishment in hell. We're going to look at that in just a second. The other thing, and this is one we definitely know, is that it affects our consequences on earth. If I got a speeding ticket on my way to church this morning, that has different consequences than if I murdered someone. Right? Definitely should have different consequences. Okay? There, there is different consequences for our sin. I want you to uh, listen to this uh, passage from Luke chapter 12, um, starting at verse 47. It says this, That servant who knows his master's will and does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. That doesn't sound the same to me. Matter of fact, if anything... The servant who knows his master's will and does not do it actually sounds more like us in the church. Also, in Luke chapter 20, Beware of these teachers of religious law, for they love to parade in flowing robes and to have everyone bow to them as they walk in the marketplaces but they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property. Because of this, their punishment will be greater. So there really is a difference when it comes to sin. All unforgiven sin definitely uh, breaks our relationship with God. It separates us from God. All of the unforgiven sin definitely. But there is a difference when it comes to to sin. And we need to understand that. All of it's incredibly serious, mind you, but there is a difference. The third one is this, and boy, I can tell you I've heard this before. I've heard the enemy put this temptation in my mind before, and it's this. I've already sinned, so I might as well continue. Have you ever had that thought before? Has the enemy ever thrown that one at you to say, well, you know what, I just can't help it. I've tried and I've fought it, so there's just nothing I can do. I can't help it. I'm only human. Heard that before? But 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 says this, If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it, it being sin, and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. If we have experienced Christ and the fullness of his forgiveness, and we continue or we get entangled and wrapped up again in sin, it is, we are worse off than we were at the beginning. I'm convinced that the most miserable people in the world today are not non-Christians. But I honestly believe that the most miserable people in the world are Christians living in sin. Because the fact is that when we continue to live in sin and then we come into an environment like this, aren't you doing everything you can hoping that nobody makes eye contact with you? It makes us uncomfortable. But sin has a progressive nature to it. And it may not seem like that big of a deal at the beginning, but it definitely is progressive. James chapter 1, starting at verse 14, says, But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it is full grown gives birth to death. 
it may seem okay for a while, but I promise you that sin ultimately does lead to death. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, says, uh, Jesus says this, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. We need to be in a continually repent, uh, repent, repentant lifestyle. The key word there, the key part of that word repent is re the pent part is actually, what's the top floor of a really tall building called? The penthouse, okay? Repent, returning to the highest standard of living. To repent, to return to God's high standard. I want you to listen to uh, this sentence that I came across this week, and, and it, it's talking about that re word, that little phrase re. I want you to listen to this. I loved this when I came across this this week. This is, uh, I think it's key for, for us as Christians to know and to understand. When you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting of your sins and receiving Christ, your spirit will be reborn, your mind renewed, your life will be rebuilt. You will be reconciled by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, and while you rejoice, you will reap the rewards of a relationship with Jesus, causing real revival to break free. Let me say that one more time. I kind of like it. When you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting of your sins and receiving Christ, your spirit will be reborn, your mind renewed, your life will be rebuilt. You will be reconciled by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, and while you rejoice, you will reap the rewards of a relationship with Jesus, causing real revival to break free. It's a returning to what God originally intended. John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us, from all unrighteousness. Living, continuing, as a, particularly as a Christian, to, to continually dabble and live in sin not only ruins your witness, it, it will eventually come out. And it may not be... It, it comes out in one way or another. And we have a responsibility, like that responsibility, to live a repentant lifestyle. One of the things that we talk about in the Church of the Nazarene, um, and that is one of the absolutely foundational doctrines for us, is the idea, is the concept of sanctification. And when it comes to sin, a lot of times, and I think this is another spiritual myth um, that's actually out there, is that um, when it comes to sin, we just can't help it that we're going to sin all the time, so we might as well just give up. But the, the concept of sanctification, and, and we talked about having that original sin nature, and in having that sin nature cleansed by God. That we might be set apart. Scripture says... Uh, Therefore, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. And when we hear that phrase, we tend to look at that and go, I'm supposed to be holy like God's holy? Yeah, right. And I would say this. When it comes to your own ability and your own strength, when it comes to standing up against sin, if that's our measure and that's where our strength comes from, then you're absolutely right. In and of your own strength, you cannot resist sin because we do have a natural bent towards that but the word re the repent or the return i think is incredibly important uh, particularly when it comes to the concept of holiness 
Um, one thing that we've talked about uh, and a phrase that I've heard um, us use in, uh, in our denomination when it comes to holiness, sanctification, or whatever, was we, we use this phrase, Christian perfection. Anybody heard that word before? Perfection. Now, when you first think about the word perfection, what do you think of when you think of something being perfect? Anybody? No flaw. No flaw. Flawless. What else? Ultimate. Ultimate. Okay. Unblemished. Perfect. Yeah, true. Th- there is a concept that we have when it comes to perfect is this um, almost unattainable. Does anybody put that word in conjunction with perfect at times? Is that we're perfect. How can I do that? Let me give you a description and a definition of perfect that I think is what we're talking about when it comes to sanctification or purity of heart. Each and every one of us, one of the things that I think is the, one of the greatest lies that we do here is I did talk about the fact that each one of us has a sin nature. And without God in our lives, each one of us is a sinner. You and I, we were born sinful, but we weren't created sinful. Did you hear that? We were born sinful because of our sin nature, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, but we were not created sinful. If you go back to Genesis and you read when God created the the seven days of creation, actually the six and the one day of rest, when he created man, what did he say? He said, oh, this is, this is bad, this is evil, I think I should just start over again. What did he say after every single day? God created it, and he said that it was good. You and I, when we were created, were created good. Sin came in and messed it up. So our original design was to be in relationship with God. Sin came in and broke that. And because of that, you and I, unfortunately, we struggle with this. But when we talk about repenting, I believe that not just the forgiveness of sins, because forgiveness will get you a little ways, but to truly experience the ultimate power of living a uh, repented lifestyle is when we experience Christ, when we surrender our hearts fully to him, we are returning to our original design. Now let me help you understand that. This opened up the whole concept of holiness um, to me in an incredible way. Um, You see on the platform three different chairs. They've been up here. You've probably been wondering what they're for. Okay? Now... Each of these chairs is a little bit different, wouldn't you say? Okay, we've got semi-padded metal chair. We've got high-back throne chair, okay? And we've got the chairs that are in the fellowship hall that nobody likes to sit in. Metal chair. Now, what were these created and designed to do? To sit in, right? I mean, they look different. Some of them have bumps. This one has a little tear in the upholstery over here. Uh, It's dinged up a little bit. Now, what was it designed to do? To sit in. This is a perfect chair. Do you get it? This is a perfect chair because it's doing what it was originally designed to do. Now, it's not necessarily probably something I'd want to sit in for hours. I definitely wouldn't take a nap in it. Um, And based on the color, I know my wife would say, don't you dare bring that home. (laughs) However, it is doing what it was originally created and designed 
to do. So is this one created, originally designed for someone to sit in. Now, is there a huge difference between these chairs? Yeah, some of them are bigger. This one has a huge dent in it right here. Definitely wouldn't want to spend a lot of time in this chair. But each of them were created for a particular design. You were created to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we are involved, when we surrender our full heart and our full life to Jesus Christ, that is our original design. When you are living surrendered to Jesus Christ in your life, you are perfect. That is what you were created to do. And for me, that helped me understand the concept of holiness and perfection. Because sin messes it up. When you and I live in sin, we are not living as we were created to live. So when someone says, I can't help it, I'm only human, I'd say, "Uh uh-uh, no. I can help it because I am human. I was created for relationship with God. When I live in sin, I become less and less human because God created us to live in relationship with Him. That, to me, sounds attainable. Do you see where I'm coming from? But unless we have fully surrendered our heart and our life, as we sometimes say, our heart, soul, mind, and strength to Him, then we're settling for less than human. That is His original design for us. That is holiness. Wholeness to return to being set apart for his purpose. That is what we were originally created to do. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave you this morning? Maybe you're one of those people that's always kind of thought, well, I'm good enough. You know, I'm not that bad compared to Osama bin Laden and Hitler, I'm not that bad. Maybe you've kind of been living with this, and sometimes when we say that all sin is the same, sometimes we use it as rationalization to continue in our sin. The fact is, all unforgiven sin does separate you from God. But as we continue in it, the consequences of it I think, grow significantly more and more intense. And, finally, maybe, um, what you're saying is, is that, you know what, I, I, I just can't, I can't overcome this sin. Well, my question is, have you fully committed your heart and your life to him? Because when you fully commit to him, it will take time, but you will be able to say no to sin. Another little word picture for you. If I were holding a brand new baby, there's a little baby over there somewhere, or there was. Is he asleep? Shook him out in case he was being squawky. That's all right. If I was holding a little baby right here, is that little baby perfectly human? Yes. Okay, I was hoping so. I was still thinking we were in a Nazarene church, okay? Now, when that little baby's five years old, is it still perfectly human? Does it have different, do we have different expectations of it? Okay. When that little baby's 18 years old, is it still perfect, a perfect human? 
we may be tempted to say no <laughs> at that age. Just kidding. But perfectly human. Different expectations, different level of maturity, different responsibilities for an 18-year-old than there is for a 5-year-old, right? Okay? That 18-year-old is now 45. Different responsibilities, different expectations, perfectly human. When you and I become sanctified or we receive the Holy Spirit as the number one driving force in our life, we're kind of like that. A brand new Christian or a brand new person who's just sanctified, I do not expect them to have the same level of spiritual maturity that someone who's been saved and sanctified for 25 years has. Does that make them any less sanctified? Does that make them any less set apart by God? No. But we, we do this comparison thing so often, even in our sanctified life. God's the one who sanctifies. He's the one who makes us holy. Not us. Our job is to surrender or return and repent our lives to him. And I think a great way for us to celebrate this this morning is on the first Sunday of each month we receive communion. And when we receive communion, what we are celebrating is the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, so that you and I might live in victory over our very topic this morning. And so this morning, uh, we're going to do communion as, as we normally do it. And if you want to receive the elements at the altar, you're welcome to do that. If you want to receive them uh, in your seats, you're welcome to do that. But this morning, as we're receiving communion, I wonder if there might be some this morning that would say, first of all, you know what, I, I have been living in sin. I'm not obeying God. I haven't, I'm, I haven't accepted him as Lord and Savior. I haven't asked him to forgive my sins then by all means, come and let's receive communion together. And in that moment, asking him to forgive you of your sins, he'll purify you from all unrighteousness. Or this morning, if you'd say, you know what, I know I've been a Christian, but I've kind of, I've kind of been like a pinball all around um, sin, and, and I haven't really gotten to the place where I am 100% set apart for his purposes, to come in and to cleanse that sin nature so that I might become holy as he is holy. God's holy and perfect because he's doing exactly what he's supposed to do. And you and I become perfect or holy when we return to that relationship with him for which we were originally created. So this morning, if you'd like to come and be filled with the Holy Spirit, we can do that as you receive communion this morning. And if you want to do it in your seats, you're more than welcome to do that. But I do believe that this message does elicit a response from us. Sin is not something that we can be neutral in. It's not something that we should play around with. It absolutely is death to your soul. So this morning, as we receive communion, I'm asking the ushers to come forward as we prepare um, to receive the elements. And uh, if you'd like to come and kneel at the altar, we encourage you to do that if you want to remain in your seats. But let's take this time and examine our hearts and ask him how he would have you respond to the message this morning.